America from the Ground Up is made possible in part by a grant from the Michigan Humanities Council, an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Central Michigan University College of Humanities, Social, and Behavioral Sciences. The Kirby Foundation, a family foundation supporting education. And B.K. Bradshaw, author of the Crystal Brave series of young adult novels encouraging young people to explore archaeology. When it comes to the history of America's fight for independence from the British, we all know the story about George Washington and Valley Forge, about Boston and the Tea Party and the traitor Benedict Arnold. But the real story of the American Revolution was played out here in the dirt. And out here on the inland waterways of North America, it's a struggle between the British, the Canadians, the Americans, and the Indians. And in this episode, we're going to use some of the most advanced scientific technology to go underwater and reveal the hidden story of the American Revolution. The American Revolution was a world war, fought between colonials, Europeans, and Native Americans. The pitched battles and lightning raids on forts and villages and settlements that were stretched out along the continent's lakes and rivers tell a story where Europeans, Native Americans, and colonials all fought for their own individual interests. The story of the American Revolution on the frontier of Canada is about the struggle to control the inland water highways, including the St. Lawrence River, Lake Champlain, and the Great Lakes. Quebec and Montreal on the St. Lawrence and the forts of Lake Champlain were important real estate in the British plans for control of North America. Without those water highways, the interior of the continent was worthless. On the eve of the Revolution, both the First and Second Continental Congresses invited French-speaking Canadians to join the Americans in the Revolution. Those invitations were largely ignored. With or without French-Canadian support, controlling the inland waterways was critical to the American war plan. The frontier war wasn't just fought on land. Up here on the northeastern frontier on Lake Champlain, warships are the weapon of choice. Even before the signing of the Declaration of Independence, Benedict Arnold led a daring raid on St. Jean on the Richelieu River in which he captured the sloop Betsy and renamed her the Enterprise. Even before the Declaration of Independence is signed, you have these clashes between the British and the American forces, the Continental forces, um, here along this waterway. And so you have Fort Ticonderoga is taken by Ethan Allen and uh, Benedict Arnold. So you have that control. These forts have been you know, French built, then they're occupied by the British, then the Americans decide to follow that same British pattern and take over the forts one by one, moving north into what was now British North America. Firmly in control of the Lake Champlain region, the Americans launched a two-pronged attack on Canada. In the summer of 1775, while George Washington and the Continental Army were laying siege to Boston, Brigadier General Richard Montgomery set out from Fort Ticonderoga to attack Montreal and Quebec. His goal? To control Canada, but more importantly, to control the St. Lawrence River and access to the interior. While Benedict Arnold and his troops set off overland from Maine, Montgomery traveled up the Richelieu River. Their objective was to capture Fort St. Jean on the Richelieu River. The Richelieu connects the St. Lawrence River to the north with Lake Champlain to the south and forms a corridor that runs right through the heart of the colonial frontier. By November of 1775, the fort had fallen and Montreal was in the hands of the Americans. But the American advance on Quebec wasn't so simple. Montgomery's force joined up with the troops led by Arnold in an assault on Quebec City on New Year's Eve of 1775. By all accounts, that assault was a disaster for the Americans. Montgomery was killed, and Arnold's exhausted troops were no real threat to the city's defenses. Over the course of that winter, colonial forces swelled to more than 3,000 men. But as anyone who lives around here can tell you, Canadian winters are seriously arctic. And as Arnold found out, they're not exactly ideal conditions for a cheerful winter of siege warfare. By late spring of 1776, the American grip on Montreal was weakening. At the same time, conditions in the American camp are deteriorating and British forces are being swelled by reinforcements. 
In the face of British reinforcements, the Americans retreated from Quebec to Crown Point and then Ticonderoga on Lake Champlain. Arnold spent the summer of 1776 adding ships to his small fleet. Meanwhile, the British had amassed a 9,000-strong force at Fort St. Jean on the Richelieu, but they needed to replace the ships lost to the Americans. By October, the British forces numbered more than 9,000, and they had assembled a fleet of more than 30 ships, the largest of which, the Inflexible, had more than 22 guns. Compare this to Arnold's fleet of about 15 boats, none of them with more than 12 guns. By the fall of 1776, the British were ready for an attack. During the battle at Valcour Island, Arnold's fleet was outgunned. But despite heavy losses, his careful maneuvering allowed him to slip past the British fleet and burn Fort Crown Point before returning to Ticonderoga. At the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, I met with archaeologist Adam Kane to talk about one of the ships that they've reconstructed from Arnold's fleet. Adam, we're on board the Philadelphia II, and this is a replica, a recreation, of one of the boats from Benedict Arnold's fleet from the Revolutionary War. What battle is this boat associated with? It's from the Battle of Valcour Island, October 11, 1776, the most important naval engagement on Lake Champlain, where the Continental Army, on board a fleet of boats that had been built with Benedict Arnold as their commander, fought the Royal Navy. And it was sunk, that's important to remember. Absolutely. And what's the story of the recovery of that craft? Well, the, the Philadelphia does, it sinks. It's uh, a cannonball, hits it below the water line. Uh, and as the battle progresses, it steadily sinks. And eventually, it can't be kept afloat anymore. And it sinks to the bottom and is left there, uh, abandoned. And so in 1935, there was a gentleman named Lorenzo Hagland who went out and he searched for it. He dragged cables across the bottom of, bottom of Valcor Bay and managed to, to tie into it, sent down hard hat divers. They rigged it, and in 1935, it was raised for everybody to see as this great um, icon of American this, this history. Relic of American this relic, history, this, yeah. this piece of you know, the true history raised for, for everybody to see. And that boat now is in the Smithsonian. That's right. It is one of the centerpieces of the Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. And it's really one of the amazing things that you can go there and see. And you can see the real life uh, gunboat that spent uh, all that time on the bottom of Lake Champlain right now is, is right there. Adam invited me to join his team from the museum on an expedition using some exciting new science to map shipwrecks on the lake bed. So what we're doing here is we're using sound to document a wreck. It's a, a scanning 3D sonar. It takes really the, only those acoustic pictures of the wreck and it leaves it exactly the way it was when we start. So when we're finished, we're gonna have a complete map and a 3D image of the wreck and the site. And as you finish the whole area, those can all be stitched together that's, that's exactly and you'll have right. a complete three-dimensional map of the lake bed without ever having to actually disturb anything. That's exactly right. Adam and I talked with his colleague, Pierre Larocque, about how the Hudson River and Lake Champlain form a water highway system that connects Montreal and New York. They're separate watersheds. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the Hudson River flows south, Lake Champlain flows north, so that the waters don't mix. Right. But they're close enough, and they're in a general north-south alignment, mm -hmm. that it makes a natural water. So you artery. can jump from the St. Lawrence down through the Lake Champlain, yeah. and then make your way to the Hudson That's through right. the lakes, and then ultimately to the That's Atlantic. Right. You know, and really in the sense of natural waterways, highways, Lake Champlain was critical because of that. Yeah. You know, from Quebec City to New York City, connected. Yeah. So you can move commerce. People, you goods. You can move people, goods, armies. military armies. Yes. Yeah. And this was, Maybe. This, when this was the frontier, this was it. So just a few miles from where we're at now is where Benedict Arnold built the American fleet in the summer of 1776 built it in Whitehall, and he chose Whitehall because it was as far away from the British as he could get. It's at the very southern end of navigation on Lake Champlain. Right, and it's, it's a safe place. spot if you're building safe, it. Yeah. It, is, yeah. it is, and it also, if you look, you see signs in towns where it also says Skeensboro, because Philip Skeen had the only operating sawmill from St. John, Quebec, down to here. This was the next one. So, And so St. John, Quebec is where the, the, French, British, uh, the British are building right, their right, navy, because right. that's their shipyard. 
And so Arnold we're down here with a sawmill going, let's go. So he, Arnold mm -hmm. commandeers the sawmill and builds the American fleet right here in Whitehall. Colonel Philip Skeen was a loyalist who had fought at Ticonderoga in the Seven Years' War. In May of 1775, Skeensboro was seized by Americans, and after the Revolution, his property was forfeit. After the war, as many as 60,000 loyalists fled to Canada to escape retribution. Most lost their property, and many lost family members to mob violence. Their treatment remains one of the little-known tragedies of the war. Adam, here at the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, we've got a display that's from a really innovative project that is uh, very large in scale, involves the members of the public, avocational archaeologists, and professional archaeologists. What was the aim of the, of the project? That's a great question, Monty. So this is, this cannon is, is the, the end product from a project called the Valcor Bay Research Project. Mm -hmm. And it was a 10-year archaeological study at that Revolutionary War battlefield site to try and both learn about the archaeology of the battlefield, how the events unfolded to really help illustrate the history that we know about that battle. Right. And then really importantly, in fact, I would argue even more important than the archaeology, is we wanted to address what is the main threat to that battlefield. And that is the, the removal of artifacts by well-intentioned folks, divers, they're wanting to touch a true piece of history because the history is there. Uh, but what we wanted to do was provide uh, an archeological outlet, a permitted project, scientific methodology. And then once we did, once we had a, a, an understanding of the way the site laid out, we did some selective artifact recovery permitted by the state of New York and the Navy for things like the pieces of this cannon and the carriage and some other smaller artifacts. And Adam, this cannon has a really unique story and a plays a major role in the trajectory of the battle. Monty, this cannon, the story it tells us is amazing. First of all, at, at the Battle of Valcour Island in 1776, this cannon is already 100 years old. It's already antique when it's being used. And the Americans used. are cobbling together whatever they can. Anything, any, these supplies are being brought from all over. Cannons are being dug up from Crown Point and brought into the American uh, fleet. Uh, we see that with this cannon because the trunnion on the cannon, the part that sticks the out from the side, that mounts, it. that mounts into the carriage, they don't fit together. The carriage is far too large for the trunnion on this, right. uh, and so it was wrapped in lead to make the trunnion bigger, and we found those pieces of lead. So this cannon, during the Battle of Valcour Island on the gunboat New York, exploded. And that explosion killed Lieutenant Thomas Rogers, a 26-year-old uh, from Massachusetts, uh, was killed during that explosion. And you can see his memorial is in a cemetery in Massachusetts. However, his body his sump was, was left at Valcour Bay. So we have his memorial that says in, uh, on that memorial that he was killed by the splitting of a cannon on Lake Champlain. And here we have the cannon. And this is the cannon. Uh, these, these are the pieces of it that, that you know, took the life of an American patriot. And that's right something here. important to remember about shipwrecks, particularly of this kind. These are, in addition to objects of history, those are the things, they're graveyards. This is, this is where those people are buried. Absolutely. It's, that is so true. And when we do this kind of work, it's with that level of respect because you have to understand it. This is people died, you know, whether it's in the, on a Revolutionary War wreck or a commercial wreck from the 19th century. If, if it's a place that uh, people perished, you know, that's that's sacred. Over at the lab, I checked in with archaeologist Chris Sabic to see how archaeologists go about conserving iron objects that have been underwater for hundreds of years. And Chris, when it comes to conserving uh, objects that are iron or steel. What's the process to stabilize and to clean those? Sure, when, when an iron artifact comes out of uh, you know, a, the water environment, it right. can actually deteriorate like relatively this. quickly. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't like this. Uh, this is part of a, um, a grape shot stand. Mm -hmm. um, so it, even as something as substantial as iron, it's important that it gets cleaned pretty promptly. The first thing we want to do is remove the existing corrosion, and that involves using mechanical means, picks right. and, and things like that. 
as well as this process called electrolytic reduction, or we just okay. call it ER for short, where we suspend the artifact in a solution of sodium carbonate or soda ash, okay. and we pass a very mild electrical current through it. Electricity is actually coming through this wire, wire and into this steel grate at the back of the right, tank. Right, the mesh there you exactly. can see. Exactly. And as it flows through the water, it's actually breaking the water molecules apart into their component gases. Oxygen bubbles are attracted back to the steel grate, and the hydrogen bubbles are attracted to the good metal underneath the corrosion of the artifact. And that loosens it exactly. sort of from the inside out. They expand and escape to the surface and in the process help to flake some of that corrosion off. And you can see some of it collecting down here at the bottom of the tank. So it's a very slow, gentle process, uh, but it does a very effective job at cleaning uh, iron artifacts. Okay. And in terms of size, I mean, clearly we've got a range of different objects sure. here. And all you need is a larger tank. The larger the tank, you can put in larger That's objects. true, yeah. We've, uh, we've worked on things as large as uh, you know, a 12-pound cannon, which mm -hmm. uh, we built a, a purpose-built tank for that was 12 feet long and right. took a little more juice and a little yeah. more time. Same process, same chemical components, just a larger scale. That's exactly right. Uh, this process is also very effective at removing the salts from an object if it's an iron object that has come out of a saltwater environment. Ultimately, the American invasion of Canada was a failure. The British maintained control of Quebec and Montreal, but more importantly, they maintained control of the St. Lawrence River. During the summer, while Arnold built his fleet, Congress passed the Declaration of Independence, and a couple of months after Arnold's defeat at Valcour Bay, General Washington made his famous trip across the Delaware. By the end of 1777, the British controlled Fort Ticonderoga and all of Lake Champlain, as well as Philadelphia and other eastern cities. But out here on the frontier, in places like St. Louis, Detroit, and Fort St. Joseph, the archaeology records a very different war. Detroit is a modern North American city with a colonial heritage that stretches back more than 300 years. But in the rush to industrialize in the 19th and 20th centuries, concrete, glass, and steel came to dominate the landscape. And today, there's almost nothing left of Detroit's colonial heritage. In terms of the war, out here on the Western Front in the Great Lakes region, the situation was relatively peaceful. Henry Hamilton was the senior British official and the superintendent of Indian Affairs. Under him, the British used the fort as a depot to supply their Indian allies and direct attacks on American settlements throughout the frontier. American hopes to attack the fort were never realized. And Detroit would remain the heart of British power throughout the war. But that doesn't mean that the British weren't worried about attacks on their forts in the Great Lakes. The archeology span records their response. Up here at the tip of Michigan's Lower Peninsula, the British were worried about an American attack. The old wooden fort might have been suitable as a trading post, but the British commander of Colonial Mission Mackinac received orders to dismantle the wooden fort and move the entire thing to the island, which was more defensible. The British action tells us something about resource management on the frontier. Park archaeologist Lynn Evans told me that the evidence showed the British had dismantled several buildings on the mainland and moved them to the new island fort. The fort was moved here where the limestone cliffs and Good Harbor provided a more defensible location. In 1780, uh, during the American Revolutionary War, and because of the American Revolutionary War, the British decided to move their military installation and the community from what we call Michelin Mackinac today to Mackinac Island. And the reason was very simple. Mackinac Island is blessed with high natural limestone bluffs, and by relocating their fort to this bluff, it gave them great natural protection against what they thought was going to be an American attack. What's the significance of this location? Why was it so important? This is the uh, narrow body of water connecting Lakes Huron in Michigan, and just 50 miles south of Lake Superior. It's in the center of the water highway system. That's how everybody traveled at that time. So they wanted to stay in the Straits of Mackinac, 
but by moving to the island, they could take advantage of this great bluff and the natural protection it provided. And also there's a wonderful natural harbor just below. So it was a, really an ideal strategic military move to come over here. So if you want to move goods and materials, people into and out of the interior of North America, you really have to control this point. If you're coming through the, north, the, nor, the northern route, absolutely. The Straits of Mackinac was, was, and it was defined at that time as the gateway uh, to, to, the, um, to the interior. From the outset, the capture of Montreal and Quebec and establishing control of the water highways had formed the heart of American war strategy for the frontier. Despite British fears, the successful defense of Quebec and the recapture of Montreal meant that American hopes to control the inland waterways were dashed. But because the British had so few troops in the Western theater, their fears of American attack remained. To counter this, the British relied on their Indian allies. Native American foreign policy on the war was far from monolithic. In reality, you had individual tribes and individuals within the tribes, each pursuing their own foreign policy. American resentment at Indian involvement with the British ran deep. Indeed, in the Declaration of Independence, the revolutionaries wrote the following. He has excited domestic insurrections among us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. However, it appears that the inclination to inflict horrific violence on the innocent wasn't limited to the supposed savages of the frontier. On March 8, 1782, one of the most infamous incidents of the revolution took place at the Moravian missionary village of Gundenhatten, Ohio. There, American colonial militia herded men, women, and children into two separate houses where they were scalped and killed. In total, 28 men, 29 women, and 39 children were murdered. All were Indian converts to Christianity who had been living at the mission. There's a, a horrible atrocity that happened in o Ohio, um, the Gundahan Massacre. And it was just a horrible incident. These are pacifist Delaware Indians who convert to Christianity and they're coming back to get food supplies, and 93 of them are bludgeoned to death by militiamen. And this is in the 1770s or 1780s. So this is very vivid in the memory of people, native peoples living on the frontier, that these were not combatants, they were pacifists, they were Christians actually, and this is what happens when you run into the militia. And even today, um, in our language of Anishinaabemowin, the word for American is called Chamukman. And that translates into big knives. And this stems from all this frontier violence during the 1700s and 1800s, that the Americans had these large swords, big knives. And earlier in, with the French era, and even a little bit into the British era, there was a middle ground, there was accommodation. But that accommodation was slowly being eroded with American rule in the Great Lakes. There wasn't any respect that was being reciprocated, so to speak. They were just coming in and taking. And so Tecumseh does use that as a rallying point. The American treatment of the continent's native peoples would have serious repercussions in the decades to come. Here in St. Louis, Indian allies of the British, led by a former British militia captain, mounted an unsuccessful attack on Fort San Carlos, the Spanish stronghold on the Mississippi. Meanwhile, here in Niles, Michigan, the British reinforced Fort St. Joseph against a feared American attack, but it was a different threat that materialized. In 1781, a contingent of Spanish and Indian forces from St. Louis attacked and captured the fort. After briefly raising the Spanish flag, the party returned south to Spanish St. Louis. The remainder of the war on the frontier consisted of cross-border raiding with all sides brutally attacking settlements and then retreating. In the end, the real losers of the American Revolution were the Native American peoples who were fighting to stop colonial expansion west of the Appalachians and into the Ohio River Valley.
We all know the story from grade school. The scrappy Americans defeat the hated British in their taxation and win independence. And for places like Boston and Philadelphia, that was true. But the Treaty of Paris left the British in control of vast swaths of America, and that included territory here in the Great Lakes. I think the fact that there was no clear winner of the war out here on the frontier means that the people who were writing America's story largely chose not to talk about it. Instead, they play up the withdrawal of the British from the eastern states, but we know that the War for Independence didn't end with the Treaty of Paris in 1783. Almost two decades later, the Americans would fight a second war for independence that would set the established world order on its ear. Join us next time when we dig into the science that's helping archaeologists uncover the lost history of America from the ground up. Check out the America from the Ground Up website for crew blogs, behind the scenes photographs, and more. America from the Ground Up is made possible in part by a grant from the Michigan Humanities Council, an affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Central Michigan University College of Humanities, Social and Behavioral Sciences. The Kirby Foundation, a family foundation supporting education. And B.K. Bradshaw, author of the Crystal Brave series of young adult novels encouraging young people to explore archaeology.